Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Luke Swetland, President and CEO of the Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Thank you. And it is really a privilege to welcome you all here this evening. I first want to thank and acknowledge the many elected officials, their representatives, and the executive staff from a number of local municipalities who are here with us tonight, so thank you for giving us your evening. The museum is delighted to be co-organizing this event with UCSB's Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, the Community Environmental Council, the Santa Barbara Foundation, and the Santa Barbara Center for the Performing Arts, which has provided the lovely Granada Theater for us tonight. I want to particularly thank Dr. Carl Hutterer, Director Emeritus of the Museum, for his great help in organizing the program tonight. Thank you, Carl. Our media sponsor, is the Santa Barbara Independent. And we've received generous financial support from the Santa Barbara Foundation, from Union Bank, from Montecito Bank and Trust, and from the museum's Crystal Bianchi Fund for Excellence in Programming. So thank you all for making this possible. This program is being recorded by TV Santa Barbara, and it will be broadcast and streamed after we do the editing, so stay tuned for that. And we are so honored to have Joe Black here with us tonight so that we can get this message out to more folks. And now, to get this critically important conversation started, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Dr. Steve Gaines, Dean of the Bren School. Steve? Thank you, Luke, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us here for this important conversation at this town hall event. So uh, December's Thomas Fire and January's Montecito Debris Flow really shook the souls of our community. And although devastating, you know, these events also unleashed the passion and generosity of so many people who rose to the occasion to help those most in need. Along the way, though, there have been many community events to help with this and recovery. And although there's still a lot of personal and community healing for, to go forward with, we believe it is now important that we also start looking forward. How do we recover and rebuild in ways that make us more resilient to such disasters in the future? What technological, political, and social systems can reduce the impacts of future disasters and make recovery faster and far less costly. The search for greater resilience is especially important in the face of ever-growing evidence that many such extreme events are happening more often and becoming even more extreme as a result of climate change. So tonight, we begin this forward-looking discussion. And to that end, uh, we will have three components to our evening's conversation. We'll begin by asking, what can we learn from science? And we'll tap into the amazing academic experience and expertise that we have in our own community with a series of four rapid-fire talks. This will get us quickly on all of us on the same foundation. Next, we're going to turn to our keynote speaker, James Lee Witt, to learn from others. What is the new normal? What has worked to enhance resilience to other disasters in other places? What has failed? Finally, we'll ask what we can do locally in a conversation between some local thought leaders and all of you in the audience. We will explore everything from new regional planning to new infrastructure to new social systems. Building better disaster and climate change resilience will have unavoidable costs. But smart investing now will be far, more, far less expensive than recovering again in the future. 
So this, will, this event will hopefully start many new dialogues along this line in terms of looking forward to the future. So let's get going. We're gonna begin with four presentations from prominent scientists at UCSB. Now, these will not be long, drawn-out lectures. Don't worry. They're gonna be pithy, three-minute answers to key foundational questions around fire, debris flows, climate change, and opportunities for action. We're gonna start with the question of what shapes our fires. Max Moritz, adjunct professor at the Bren School, is an expert in fire dynamics and the factors that control them. So let's hear about what shapes fire. Please welcome Max Moritz. All right. Thank you, Steve. So depending on who you talk to, there will generally be one of three factors blamed for why wildfires in our region can get so large and be so damaging. One is winds, right? Parts of our landscape are subject to Santa Ana winds, one of the worst uh, fire weather conditions in the entire world, and it affects a lot of Southern California. Parts of our landscapes are also affected by sundowner winds, much more localized canyon-specific winds here. So winds are one, get one portion of the blame often. Two is fuels accumulation of, of abundant fuels on the landscape. You can't have fires like this without fuels, and that often gets uh, a big part of the blame. And third, humans as ignition sources. We're everywhere, we're always gonna be supplying a start on, under the worst possible conditions, and that's, some argue that that's really the key. I'm gonna argue instead that it's actually not any one, but it's all three, and that viewing this as a complex problem is really necessary for us to find a comprehensive solution uh, to our wildfire problems. So looking at a fire progression map, this is from the Thomas fire, we see some things about winds that jump out at us. In the darker greens and yellows of this map, <clears throat> and on the bar chart here, which shows daily fire spread in acres, we notice that in the first five days of the Thomas fire, there was this explosive growth. It grew to over 200,000 acres just in the first five days. This is phenomenal. And this coincided with one of the longest and strongest Santa Ana wind events recorded for this area ever. We did have some sundowner wind-driven uh, activity right up here um, above Montecito. But overall, it was a Santa Ana wind-driven event. And from the maps like this, we, we can learn a lot about the role of winds. If we zoom out to a broader landscape and a longer span of time, we can use a fire history map like this. The uh, more recent fires are in red, and then as we go back in time, they fade into to red and then to blue. From research that's been done on fire patterns from these maps and wind patterns that drive a lot of these fires, we've learned something about Santa Ana's. Basically, we don't see Santa Ana's in the Santa Barbara region. They tend to occur not exclusively along the, the Ventura County line, but they, they tend to incur, occur Ventura southward. And during those events, when fires occur, they tend to burn through young, medium, and old age fuels pretty readily. So the time since the last fire, when fires get going under Santa Ana winds here and southward, is not as influential as it is, say, up here in Santa Barbara, where we don't get Santa Ana winds. We have sundowners, which are much more localized. And as a result, in our, in our front range here, we have the ability of fuels to play a much stronger role. So fuels are important, but their influence uh, varies uh, across space in our region. Next. If I point it this way. Oh, okay. <coughs> Lastly, ignition sources. So a human footprint map is a map of our influence on the landscape based on our housing uh, density, our road network, our, rail, our railway lines, our ag lands, and our utility infrastructure. 
And if you look at a map like this of, of just how pervasive our influence is on the landscape, you notice that even in our backcountry, you know, our wilderness areas, which we think of as pretty remote, um, they're not as remote and, and, and untouched as, as we often think of them. And so um, human ignitions, it's true that we are pretty much flooding the landscape with ignitions. And it's, so it's also true that whenever there's, the conditions are ripe, it's very likely that we will provide an ignition. So if I had to leave with one take-home message, it would be that resilience is linked to our perspective, and we need to change our perspective to one of coexisting with fire instead of fighting it. Um, fire isn't going away anytime soon. It's complex. And we need to think of it like other natural hazards, like earthquakes, floods, landslides. We need to manage our landscapes accordingly. We need to plan our lives accordingly. We need to locate and build our communities accordingly so that we reduce our vulnerability over the long term to this essential and inevitable natural process that is wildfire. Thank you. Thank you, Max. And uh, now that we have some sense of the shapes of fire, I think it's only appropriate that we do our own version of the shape of water. And um, so we're going to next turn to thinking about floods and debris flows and ask the question of when can we expect the next debris, debris flow? And for the answer, we're going to turn to Ed Keller, an environmental geologist and professor of earth science and environmental studies at UCSB. He has probably been the busiest speaker in the county uh, since the debris flow. Um, so please welcome Ed Keller. Thank you. See if it'll come up. Mm. There we go. One of the questions that's often asked me when I made some presentations of interest to a lot of people is when and how likely is another debris flow? No one in our lifetimes has probably experienced anything like this. And so it's, I've been trying with our research team at UCSB to put it in some sort of perspective. Uh, we know that there's been lots of big debris flows in the past. Uh, the most recent one, other than the January event, was about 1,000 years ago in Rocky Nook Park. And you guys ought to go up there and look at it. Wander through Rocky, Bar Rocky Nook. Look at all those boulders. Ask a question. Where did these boulders come from? I can tell you they came from Schofield Park. And we've dated it several different ways, so we know the age of that event. We've also dated another older debris flow that I'll talk about a little bit. Well, I really won't talk. I've only got three minutes. You know, I'm usually programmed for an hour. But anyway, uh, that's 125,000 years old. In between, we haven't got a clue. So I'm going to tell you lots of things tonight that we don't know much about. We've been studying in Montecito for over 20 years. And I can say a kind of short answer is that uh, it's possible we'll get another debris flow uh, next winter if we see a really intense rainstorm, say a 1 in 100, 1 in 200 chance. So that makes it unlikely. Okay? We don't see 100-year storms in terms of intense precipitation every year by any standpoint. So, uh, but, it's, but it's possible. Okay? We, we never can, can write it out entirely. One thing we're kind of interested in is these so-called stages. And I've broken them into three. The first stage is you have to have material to move down the slopes uh, to, to, to actually form the debris flow. And these are in the steeper mountain areas where boulders, maybe for hundreds of years, have been accumulating in the, in the streams, like Cold Springs and other streams. They all have trails along it. A lot of you have probably hiked them. You've seen the wonderful boulders that were there, okay, before, t before the January event. And a good many of them are gone. How many are gone? We have no clue. Because uh, there are enough left there to still produce another debris flow? Maybe. We have 10 people up there working with GPS and measuring the boulders and measuring the mud. And in a few months, we'll have a better idea of the budget of this event. 
We're just about ready to calculate the volume from differences between 2006 and 2018 LIDAR, but we haven't done that yet. So we need all this accumulation. That may take a long time, we think. Okay, secondly, we need a wildfire. We know we had a big, intense wildfire, and the wildfire burned almost everything off. It affected the soils, and runoff increased, increased tremendously. That is, following the wildfire, well, you might get a rainfall from a half an inch of rain uh, under vegetation. Very little would run off. There was hardly any floods at all in uh, Rattlesnake Creek and Mission Canyon, but up in the, where the fire was, we had tremendous uh, uh, runoff that kind of mobilized what was going on. So we need this fire. The fire is important in Southern California debris flows. I should mention after every fire, we expect debris flows, but normally little ones not these things that can affect entire communities. So having said that, the Rocky Nook event is several times or more bigger than what happened in Montecito. So we need that. And then we need this intense, short duration rainfall. We had like a half an inch in five minutes. That's like getting in the shower, you know, and just let it run all over you. And all the dirt you've been accumulating from studying debris flow runs off to the shower. <laughs> so we have that happening. You can also get intensities like maybe up to three quarters of an inch in an hour might be enough to produce these events. But we have a history of these in Southern California. We know it takes this intense precipitation. And then what happens is you, when this runoff from the slope comes down, it produces a mud. And it infiltrates the boulders and it raises the pore pressures, increases the mass of the thing, and eventually on a steep slope it takes off as a debris flow, moving maybe 35 miles an hour. That's across this stage, okay, in about a second. You can't outrun it, you can't outdrive it. You kind of have to have some idea it might be coming. You could go to the sides, up the, up the sides of a valley where it's, be, where it's coming through. You only have to go up 15, 20 feet. But uh, we, these things are moving really rapidly. The boulders are bobbing along. Can you imagine a, a flow with ping pong balls in water? That's what it looks like because the unit weight of the boulders and the mud's about the same, so they literally float. There's no limit to the size of boulder you can move. And that's an amazing process if you think about it. It's not great if you're down there where your house is. We know this event lasted about 20 minutes, the total event. There was at least three mud flows, maybe four. And you might say, well, how do you know that? Well, the houses shook, the ground shook, uh, Tom Dunn told me he's listened to debris flows. It sounds like machine guns going off and rocks grinding. Bam, 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 bam. It sounds so loud, it's fearful, okay? So, so you, people obviously not experiencing something like that. It was a tremendous shock to their auditory, and then their house is shaking and so forth. So but anyway, you got the idea to check the seismic records where we look for earthquakes, and we see a record. And the record's 20 minutes long. It looks like it contains three flows starting in the east and moving west as the rain moved, uh, pardon me, west to east as the rain moved from west to east. We're still refining that. Tells us something that we might expect with the moving mass of rain would affect one canyon, then the next, then the next. And that seems to, to have happened. So that's kind of interesting. So the short duration precipitation events. Now, we have short duration precipitation events all the time that, are, that may be fairly high in certain time periods, but we generally don't get debris flows unless we have this wildfire before. So it's kind of like the one-two punch that Boxer is always talking about, but you've got to get the one first. And it's a fairly rare event. So fires come about every 50 years or so. So, so I made this little map, just a cartoon, and the main point of it, though, is that Montecito is literally built entirely on debris flow fans, the whole place. And there's boulders almost everywhere. And if you live there, you've seen these boulders and marveled at them, and they're wonderful for landscaping. Few people have asked us, where do they come from? Why are they here? And uh, we had an idea 20 years ago when we were studying Rocky Nook, but in Montecito, we mapped the fans, but we never dated the flow. So now we need to go in there and date as many flows as we can with radiocarbon, with, uh, uh, with looking at cosmogenic nuclides, any way we can. And then we get a long list of dates. We can say how often these things actually might occur, which is an important thing for planning. So maybe they occur every 500 to 1,000 years. 
Well, that's similar to a large earthquake. So it's on that magnitude, we think. But, you know, you can get a, an earthquake, a big earthquake, and get another one the same size the next year. They're, they're probabilistic oriented and oriented to other things. So that holds here, too. Uh, these are some of the ages we've got. A thou oops. Try again to go back. They don't like my map. This is not on my time. <laughs> Where's the next one? All right, well, I'm, I, I got up this. I'm, I'm going to forget that. So the Montecito's built on these debris flow fans. And we're going to map them carefully and get dates on them. And that will help a great deal in understanding this hazard. So again, going back to my first thing, how likely is it next year? Very unlikely, but possible. And that's kind of a cop-out. I understand that. But that's the nature of statistics and reflects how little we know about this event. We don't even know the volume of it yet. We are not sure about the physical processes that actually led to the development of the mud, that led to the filling the boulders, that led to the pore pressure, that led to the flow. And no one saw these boulders bobbing along. It was all dark. So that's a bit of a problem. They're probably telling me to get off pretty quick here. So <laughs> anyway, uh, that's OK. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. I, I wouldn't worry too much next year, but pay attention to the weather and the, first, and the people are sending out the warnings. And if I live there and they said there's a high intensity storm coming in, I'd go visit a beach up, up uh, north or someplace or go someplace, okay? Thank you. <laughs>
Perhaps most importantly is that precipitation is going to fall more often in large storm events. So the 200-year storm event that we were talking about may actually now become the 100-year storm event. We can then say, OK, how does this change in climate, when we put that into our models and understanding of fire and vegetation, what do we know? Well, one thing we know for sure is that Santa Barbara is going to continue to be a place where we will have frequent fires, and sometimes they're going to be large. We will have to continue to live with fire. That's not going to change. What may change, because precipitation becomes more variable, is the time it takes fuels to recover. But because it's more variable, sometimes fires will recover, fuel, fires will happen more frequently than they did in the past, and sometimes it will take the fuels longer to recover, so the fire return interval will increase. Both will happen. We are going to get more intense storm events, but keep in mind if the 200-year event becomes a 100-year event, it's still pretty rare. So if I summarize all this for you, I'm basically saying that climate change will be noticeable. It's going to happen. But the impacts on fire and floods in Santa Barbara are relatively moderate. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't care about climate change. It influences other things we care about. It influences water supply. It results in sea level rise. And maybe most importantly, Santa Barbara, it's not an island. You may think it is, but it's not. And these same climate model predictions for the more snow-dominated parts of the state up in the Sierras here, these same changes have much more dramatic effects. Earlier snowmelt means the fire season in that parts of the state is much longer, and we're already seeing larger and more intense wildfires. We have to care about that in Santa Barbara because we share resources with the whole state. When we, have, we share budgets, we share people who help us deal with fires when they're happening and the aftermath of those fires. We share water with the state. So these changes that are happening statewide are going to have local implications when we continue to live with the fire in the future. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Naomi. Uh, so finally, in the face of these kinds of disasters, how should we respond? Sarah Anderson is a political scientist and professor in the Brent School who has studied how people have responded in the face of other kinds of catastrophes. So what can we learn from these experiences? Please welcome Sarah Anderson. Thank you. I want to tell you a tale of two cities. It's our city now and our city in three years. And I think all of you know that when you look at that, at our city now, you see a black line and you know exactly what that black line is. It's the outline of the Thomas fire. And you know about that because we've just experienced wildfire and we've just experienced debris flows and we're thinking about them. We're thinking about fire insurance, and we're thinking about brush clearance, and we're thinking about rebuilding. But in just three short years in our community in 2021, it's three short years, but we will have moved on. We might not even remember exactly where that black line was anymore. And we'll be thinking about what to have for dinner or what we left on our desk at work. And it's not just us who respond that way, but governments actually respond that way as well. We use 10 years of data over the whole Western United States to look at how governments respond to wildfires. And what we found is that our community now and the hills above it are about 50% more likely to get a government project to help us deal with wildfire, to do some brush clearing, to make the next fire maybe not so bad. Now, but after three years, we're kind of back to business as usual. So people forget and governments forget. At the same time that wildfire risk is going up, 
over time because our chaparral is regrowing, our, our, our fuels are regrowing. Our attention to wildfire, the salience of wildfires, is actually going down. And so this is a tragedy, but it's also a window of opportunity to make long-term changes now. Our human impulse, of course, is to think about recovery, and that is critically, critically important. But in the face of that fire-dominated landscape um, that Dr. Moritz told us about, the possibility of future debris flows that Dr. Keller told us about, and the consequences of climate change that Dr. Tegg showed, we have to make changes now that last. <coughs> Things like um, retrofitting houses so they're more likely to survive a wildfire, so we can live with wildfire. Um, implementing land use changes, and thinking about disaster management systems that work. Now, we're all here in this room mobilized, and one of the things that we need to think about doing is influencing the decision makers who can actually make those long-term changes happen. Influencing city officials, county officials, federal officials. We did a survey of about 250 state legislators, and we learned two really important things about how they think about disaster management. The first thing that we learned is that they pay attention to past losses much more than what might happen in the future. So when we talk to them about disaster in terms of what had happened in the past, they allocated about 20% more funding to disaster management than when we talked about what might happen. So our job is to tell our story now and to keep telling our story. That's what matters. The second thing that we learned when we spoke to all these legislators is that um, they pay attention to voters now. So that's us now. We're doing the right thing by being here and thinking about this. Um, but they pay attention to experts more later. And so while we're in this room, our other job is to assemble a group of experts around us who can help to keep that momentum going into the future. I'm confident that if we can engage decision makers to make these long-term changes now, now while we have this moment of attention, that we can um, take the worst of times and make them the best of times and build one resilient city, one resilient community. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for describing the window of opportunity and the kinds of approaches we need to take advantage of. It's a per set up, first perfect setup for the transition to the next part of our conversation. And so building on these scientific foundations, let's see what we can learn from others. James Lee Witt was the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, during the Clinton administration. He is well known for transforming FEMA from an unsuccessful bureaucratic agency to an internationally acclaimed disaster management agency. He currently serves as senior advisor to Fortune 500 companies and government leaders around the world. And in these diverse roles, he has seen so many crises and how communities have responded to them after the fact. So we have a lot to learn from the insights he has gleaned from other successes and failures in building more resilient communities in the face of crises. So please welcome James Lee Witt for his talk, The New Normal. Thank you very much. I don't think I can accomplish this speech in three minutes with an Arkansas accent. <laughs> I hope that you can understand this as you translate it. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to be here tonight. And the last time I was in Santa Barbara, I was up watching the aftermath of the debris field and the fires and it, you know I've seen the time I was at FEMA I had responded to 340 presidential disaster declarations 
And I've seen the earthquakes, the wildfires, the tornadoes, the tsunamis, you can name it, all around the world. And I want to thank the Community and Environmental Council tonight for asking me to be here to share some of my thoughts with you. I also want to thank Partnership for Resiliency Communities who ask us to help you to rebuild back better, safer, and more resilient. And Brett Matthews, I thank him so much for what he's doing with the nonprofit and uh, really going to make a difference for you in Santa Barbara and, and the cities in this community. I'd like to thank the first responders and I'd like to thank Pat Murphy and the firefighters that all I met with the last time I was out here and the stories that they told. All the years that I was director of FEMA, every event that I went to, public safety, emergency management, firefighters was the first ones on the scene. The first one caring for people, first one getting people out of harm's way and putting their lives in danger every single time. I know that you have been through a traumatic event. And I know the loss of families, friends, and the loss in the community and the businesses is traumatic. And you know, as Director of FEMA, I've saw the small garden variety disasters, I've seen the major disasters, and I've seen the cat catastrophic events. And you have had a catastrophic event. There's no doubt about that. But now's the time to think about what are we going to do now? Are we going to continue the same path that we have in the past? Are we going to look at Santa Barbara County and the communities in a new way? It's going to be important that every person has a voice. It's going to be important that every committee that's working so hard to help bring all the data and scientific knowledge together so that you can make good decisions and so that you can move forward in building a lot better, safer community and more resilient community. You know, a lot of the communities that I've been in after events like this, we never realize the economic losses. We never realize how much a difference it makes. In some of the communities that we've done surveys in, 20% of the small businesses never reopen. In the small businesses that does reopen, within 12 months, they close as well. So it's important through this public-private partnership that we build a coalition that's going to use every idea, every comment, in a way that's going to help you to make sure that you are more resilient in the future. But the scientific data that you heard tonight is an important part of that information gathering that's going to help you be stronger and more resilient in the future. I have a special connection in California starting from my first days in FEMA. In 1993, there was a declaration for severe storms, mudslides and flooding that included Santa Barbara. The Laguna Beach fire and the Malibu fire that I was at, and Governor Pete Wilson was with me, and when we went up in the Laguna Beach fire, there was one house that survived that fire, and the family was still living in it. I asked him, I said, what did you do? He said, we had clay tile roofs, we had four feet overhang on our house, we had fire-resistant siding, we had fire-resistant shrubbery, and we made sure that any brush was cleared out on our property, and we survived the fire. in the Northridge earthquake. First Lady Hillary Clinton came out and we took her to this historical community with these big historical homes. And Northridge earthquake was like a rolling earthquake. And every house in that community was shifted off the foundation to the south, except one house. 
and the guy and his family were still living in it. And I said, he came out, and we were standing in his front lawn, and I said, what did you do? And he said, I went down to the county library, and I checked out a FEMA OES videotape, <laughs> how to retrofit your house yourself. <laughs> I spent $1,000, and I still live here, and I had no damage. So there's a way that we can build back better and safer by using technology, using information, and making sure that we build back in stronger and better. It was interesting over the years at FEMA, Vice President Gore and Senator Diane Feinstein and I came out here and it was a flood. And this community was just almost surrounded by water. And we actually flew in on a Chinook helicopter and landed on the highway. And as we were walking up the highway to where the, all these volunteers and everybody was sandbagging down in this drainage ditch, ditch bringing up the levee higher, one of the reporters came over to me and he said, Director, do you think you could get the vice president down in that ditch to throw some sandbags so we could get a photo op? I said, yeah, I think so. So I go up next to the vice president and I said, sir, they want you to get down that ditch <laughs> and throw some of those sandbags so you can get a photo op. He said, okay. So we walk up there and he goes, hey guys, how are you? I think I'll get out and help you. And he goes down that bank and the Secret Service goes nuts. One of them trips and rolls. And he gets down there and throws a few sandbags and he comes back up and he said, James Lee, what in the world was wrong with Secret Service? I said, well, sir, I just found out all those guys in that ditch are convicts. <laughs> he said, that's why that guy asked me for a pardon. You know? <laughs> He was, a fun, he was a lot of fun to travel with, I promise you. <laughs> we used to take off at Andrews Air Force Base in Air Force Two. They made him quit doing this, but we used to take off, and he would have a piece of cardboard board, and he'd surf, her down the, surf down the aisle of the airplane, you know. He'll probably kill me for telling that. But, but you know, back then, uh, we had an El Nino year. And we did the very first El Nino Climate Change Summit in Santa Monica. Vice President Gore was there, Senator Feinstein, Senator Boxer, Senator Mikulski from Maryland. She was the chair of our appropriation, full appropriation committee of FEMA. We had BBC, we had every network around the world there. And it was a huge event. And I have to tell you, over the years, I have seen what climate change has done, and I have seen the events and the intensity of the events change. And if you look and if you track it, give an example. In my little town of Dardanelle, Arkansas, which you can Google and look up, I think it's still on the internet. <laughs> we had six inches of rain in two hours. Last year, we had 26 tornadoes. This year, we've already had six tornadoes in one day. These events are stronger and more frequent than we've ever seen in the past. And as one of the presented, presenters said earlier, California and one third of the West over the next few years are gonna be facing some severe drought. So do your research, know where you live, know what the elements are, and know how you can build to protect yourself and your property against those elements. 
And we will, in the coming years, continue to have a problem with water shortage. There's no doubt about it. Even in Arkansas, on my farm, and particularly some of the soybean farmers and rice farmers and all, you know, they used to have 90 foot deep wells. Now they have 190 feet deep wells. But they've gotten smarter. They're recycling that irrigation water to be able to continue to grow rice. Back in FEMA in 1997, I started a program called Project Impact. It was the very first public-private partnership program created in the federal government. Because I saw what mitigation could do in the prevention of the losses that I have seen in communities across our country. This program, the reason I started was this program after the 93 flood, the 94 earthquake in California and many others, and we did a cost-benefit analysis, and it showed that every dollar spent on prevention saved $7 in future losses. But you can think about how many lives it saved and how much ang anger and anguish and pain that people went through that they lost everything that they had worked all their life for. So this program, with a small investment from, from the federal government, we started identifying with seven pilot communities in the United States, high risk. Seattle, Washington, Oakland, California, Santa Barbara, Barbara was one of them, Deerfield Beach, Florida, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was a huge success. And when we left FEMA, we had 250 communities in this program, and people were so excited about it, they didn't want seed money, they just wanted our help to build that public-private partnership. We have over a thousand corporate business par partners helping in these communities across the country. We had NASCAR, can you believe that? NASCAR passed out 62 million pamphlets in prevention for us. Home Depot, many others. Home Depot in Deerfield Beach, Florida set up an entire aisle in their store of products that individuals could use to make their homes hurricane res wind resistant. And they had a training class every Saturday. So this is what a public-private partnership can do. Well, the last summit I had in Washington, D.C. in this program, we had the four top NASCAR drivers there, and they wanted to go to White House to see the Oval Office, so I took them. And they had to sit behind the president's desk and take a picture, you know, of course. Well. 2,500 people from these 250 communities. And folks, let me tell you something. You would have thought they were sniffing glue out of a paper bag. They were so excited. <laughs> I'm serious. It was unbelievable. But when President Bush, and I have to tell you, President Bush was a dear friend of mine. When he was governor, I worked with him a lot. He even asked me to stay as director of FEMA if he got elected president. And I told him eight years was long enough. And, um, but they canceled this program. And so what we have decided to bring this program back to life from the private sector. In Santa Barbara, with the help of Brett and his nonprofit organization, Santa Barbara is going to be the first community. Santa Barbara County and the communities are going to be the first one in the new Project Impact 2. We had some great meetings today. And I can tell you right now, you've got some magnificent people working on your benefit right now that's developing the plan. We looked over the draft. They're not finished with it. Developing the plan to make sure that you are able to build back better and safer and start minimizing the risk and be more resilient in the future. And I believe in them. I th they're very dedicated. And they work very hard to make sure this is ha this will happen. Did you you've seen last year 
the devastation we had from the hurricanes in Texas, in Florida, in Puerto Rico, in the Virgin Islands. And I was just recently in Puerto Rico meeting with a lot of the cities there. And even one of the communities, this has been about three or four weeks ago, one of the cities still had 65% out of power. You know? And so what we have to think about after being there and seeing what they were going through, and some people still had no roofs on their houses. And we have to also think about renewable, renewable energy. How can we make sure <laughs> that we cut the fossil fuel, but we also have the ability through solar, wind, or fuel cell technology that we have energy that can be seamless if we have power outage, but also can help our environment and keep our environment clean. And that's another issue that we're gonna be continually facing for the future. California has probably done more than any state with Tesla cars and electric cars and, and clean fuel. You've done an unbelievable job. We were in Sunnydale, California, Rod and I was, as the first time I rode in a Tesla car. I thought, and he said, well, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of how fast this thing can go. Whew, let me tell you. Hey, I've got a 2011 Shelby GT500 Mustang, and it goes pretty fast, but that thing was pretty fast too. But you know, in 2017, the United States experienced 16 billion dollar disasters. And over 300 billion, think about that. Major insurers, the billions they lost, the economic losses, the losses that families lost, and the U.S. had three billion dollar disasters in the first three months of 2018. When I talked to Brock Long, the new administrator of FEMA, back a few months ago, he said that they had 17 open disasters right now. So we're faced with a situation that we can mitigate the losses, we can save lives, and hopefully building more resiliency that the insurance companies will listen to us and the insurance companies will give some better rates. We met with Glenn Palmer, Palmer Tuesday. He's head of the California Earthquake Authority. He flew up here to meet with us, Glenn Pomeroy. And they're working on, on an issue right now with the California state legislators to be able to try to put hundred million dollars into more resilient communities in California, which would be a great program, but also to be able to cut the price of earthquake insurance, which would be fantastic, because you know that only 10% of the population in California has earthquake insurance. And when I was in Northridge earthquake, I said, why didn't you have earthquake insurance? And they said, well, I said my deductible is 25 to $35,000 and said, you know, the average cost of an earthquake is about that much. So why should I buy earthquake insurance? So that price has to come down so we can have coverage to cover that because you have that risk here as well. I know recently you had, what, a 5.2? I never will forget I was in a hotel in Northridge earthquake and I was on the ground floor and I heard what I thought was a train coming. It was an aftershock from Northridge and it was a 5.8 and everything was shaking around the room. And that was the first earthquake experience I had. And it was a small one. Let me, let me just share this with you too. When Hurricane Katrina hit, Governor Blanco called me, she was the governor of Louisiana at that time. And I went down and and she hired my company to help them in the recovery efforts. And it was 
another catastrophic event at that time. It, it became the costliest disaster in our his, history at that time. And we worked with them for 10 years. Do you know how long the Northridge earthquake disaster operation was open? 15 years. So you're not going, this is not a short term event. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of planning, and it's going to take a huge commitment. It will not be over within six months or 12 months. It's going to take time. So be patient. And I know it's easy to say, but hard to do. I have to say, I want to applaud the Community Environmental Council for convening this meeting. It's very important. Your experience and knowledge will help to inform and drive decisions. And I hope that you will partner with us and the nonprofit with Brett and us in making sure we do what's right and we do what's best. And we use every idea, particularly for the county and the, and the cities and the individuals. Let me say this, climate change is real. And those that say it's not real, we're going to see more devastation, much larger events than we've ever seen in the past. And I don't mean the driver of bad news, but it's true. I have seen so much of it over my years everything from tsunamis to you name it. But I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share a few, a few thoughts. But now I'm going to close with this. When I was living in Virginia, and I lived in D.C. and Virginia 19 years, eight years with, with Bill Clinton, and I could tell you uh, for two hours stories. <laughs> Maybe sometimes we have a convene again, I'll tell you stories, how's that? But uh, Bob suggested me to do that, didn't you, Bob? <laughs> I'm going to close with this. When I lived in Virginia, I was on the board of the John Leland Seminary School. And we were having a fundraiser at this home. And there was a Baptist minister there from Argentina. And he said, you know, in Argentina, we have a saying. He said, if you're not part of planting the trees of the future, you do not deserve the honor of standing in the shade of the trees of the past. Folks, we have a chance to plant the trees of the future, and we dare not fail. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, James Lee, for those for sharing your really in, inspiring thoughts and your insights you've gained from so many different experiences that are really relevant to our community. And so that's a perfect transition that we're now going to switch to a focus of what can we do here. And so I'm going to turn things over to Sigrid Wright to help uh, uh, start that conversation. Sigrid is the CEO and Executive Director of the Community Environmental Council. And she's going to take things from here for a conversation about where we can go here in our common community. Thank you. Well, I am glad to be here. Um, so as Steve just mentioned, I am the executive director for the Community Environmental Council. We are a nearly 50-year-old environmental organization here in Santa Barbara. Um, headquartered here. We serve the Tri-County region. We were um, formed in 1969 uh, in response to the oil spill. So I like to really say that we were f born out of a disaster and um, we're very, uh, very much supported by the community and, and solutions oriented. For the last 10 years, we've been focused almost entirely on regional solutions to climate change. So I've been wanting to have this conversation for a long time. And really grateful that we have such a, a um, powerful and great panel. And, and what I'm wanting to do tonight actually is start talking about solutions. And we heard a couple of ideas um, put forth. 
We've also been collecting comments and questions from the audience uh, at, at Earth Day over the last weekend in the, um, in the lobby this evening and on Twitter. So we're gonna dig right into that. Um, first, I actually wanted to start with a, a, a definition of climate resilience as it um, is defined how I would define it. The ability of our social and ecological systems to withstand and adapt to the variable and extreme weather associated with climate change. I feel like this is a phrase that I would like to start um, hearing us discuss and, and um, become more of a kind of common household phrase, climate resilience. We have a little over half an hour to explore solutions, so I'm gonna be moving us along and really kind of take this into kind of a conversational um, format here. And I, but I also recognize it's just the beginning of this conversation. I'm hoping, um, funding dependent, that we could move towards a, maybe an all-day symposium sometime by the end of the year where the ideas and um, themes and solutions that get presented here, we can dig into that a little bit more. But I'm going to start by introducing our panel. And I could spend a half an hour on each one of them, I'm, and I'm really excited. Um, but one of the things I'm most uh, pleased about here is that each of our panelists are really tied to the community. They've been here a while, they have strong roots here. So Pat McElroy is, um, well he announced actually <laughs> on the morning, some of you may know this, on the morning of December 4th, he had announced his retirement as the Santa Barbara, City of Santa Barbara. 100 day notice. <laughs> 100 day notice <laughs> on December 4th, the morning, as um, fire chief for the City of Santa Barbara. So we all know what happened. Uh, the evening of December 4th, and those 100 days were some pretty long days, and we've had some conversations around um, how the Thomas Fire and the debris flow really punctuated his career. Um, Pat moved here for, to Santa Barbara to go to UCSB in the early 70s, so you've almost been here 50 years. I think you have to be here 50 years to qualify as a local, that's what I've been told. Um, he started his career with the U.S. Forest Service, and then uh, moved on to the City of Santa Barbara Fire Department, been fire chief since 2013, worked incidents throughout the country, including Hurricane Katrina, North Ridge earthquake, and I think Doss actually mentioned to me that he is one of the most requested incident commanders of the West. So let's please welcome Pat McElroy. <laughs> Maricela Morales, um, just a really great spirit. I, Love you, Maricela. Um, also has deep roots here on the South Coast. She was born to immigrant parents, attended Fillmore Public Schools, um, went on to break all kinds of glass ceilings, um, got a bachelor's from Stanford University, a master's in counseling psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. She was the first Latina elected to the Port Wyneme City Council and then went on to become that city's first Latina mayor. She began um, at CAUSE, which is a social justice organization um, it, based in Ventura. She bega began as a volunteer almost 20 years ago, went on to become the first executive, um, female executive director. And she has worked on issues including living wage, health coverage for the uninsured, women's economic justice, farm worker bills of, bill of rights. She's a so strong social justice advocate and a mama and, uh, and a real straight shooter. So I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Doss Williams, we should all know. Um, Doss grew up in Isla Vista. He's a born, and, born and raised. Attended local schools, including Dos Pueblos, and uh, for a little while, City College. Got his bachelor's at UC Berkeley, master's at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management. Um, got into organizing when he was on campus, yeah, and was one of the youngest to serve on the Santa Barbara City Council. Then went on to serve us and. Um, at the California State Assembly where he really emerged as a strong climate leader. Um, recently returned to Santa Barbara to raise his daughter and to serve the first as the first district board of supervisors um, representative. And he's really been in the thick of things as, as we know first district has been hit hard by the Thomas Fire and debris flow. So please join me in welcoming Doss. <laughs> So 
so like I said, I want to move us toward a conversation around solutions, but I'm going to just start um, with some foundation setting and just ask each of you, maybe starting with you, Pat, about what your greatest concerns are for a region when it comes to clim as climate change unfolds. You've got a unique perspective. You're very much on the, you've been on the front lines. So what, what emerges for you as your greatest concern? Um, thank you, Sigrid, for um, having me here uh, tonight, first of all. Um, what I'm alarmed by is in December of 2017, <clears throat> we have the longest string of red flag alert days in a row in, in my, in my, uh, since they've been keeping those records to the National Weather Service. So we had 11 and a half days from December 3rd on where we were in red flag alert in December. Mm -hmm. um, things that uh, happened this year in terms of fires, there's certain truisms that uh, people in Santa Barbara in, the fire, in uh, firefighting um, took as kind of gospel. Hmm. Uh, the, north, the north slope of the San Ynez range doesn't burn, which is a slope above Lake Pachuma. Well, it, it did. And, and the Whittier fire uh, spoke another maxim, which was no fires don't burn from the back country into the front country in Santa Barbara. Well, within 10 hours, it had burned from Lake Pachuma to the hills above Goleta and was moving moving in the front country. These are things that just, red flag alerts in December, these type of things are not something we're used to. The fire behavior is very extreme and, um, and, getting, and getting worse every year. If you look at the, since 1990, uh, 17 of the largest fires in California have occurred. And six of those are in uh, Los Padres National Forest, which is a forest surrounding ours. So, it's really important, I think, that in the, the slide that uh, Dr. Tag had up here about simple solutions and, and, and being wrong and looking at problems um, in a simple way is, is uh, get you to your answer really quickly. But it, um, what we're dealing with is, is complex issues. That were there not climate change, we're still s struggling with any number of things that are, that are happening around here. And one of the big things in the fire world um, in the world that we live in here, we live in the wildland urban interface. Um, well, around the country, from the Carolinas to Florida to the western United States, the country's de-urbanizing. About 20% of the population in the last 25 years is, is moved into fire-prone areas. Uh, 13 million new homes um, in, in the last uh, 25 years have been in, built in uh, land that was previously uh, considered wildland. And so what that does to our business is in areas where we used to be able to let things, let things burn and you anchor off a road and try to keep a fire in a different area, we're having to actively engage mm -hmm. now because there's houses and people. Mm -hmm. And it changes the orientation that, that we have to, um, to how we aggressively fight fire, control fire. and. Um, I've, I've, I've grown weary of uh, <coughs> hearing um, politicians on TV say, well, when I asked about climate change, climate change says, well, I'm not a scientist. And, and I'm not a scientist either, mm -hmm. but I try to listen to scientists, mm -hmm. and I try to listen to my own experience. <laughs> <laughs> and my own experience is telling me that it's a far more uh, dangerous world in firefighting um, than it was when I started. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me in some of our conversations, um, Pat, is the number of times, you, and I've said this to you, the number of times you've used superlatives, and you use some of them here tonight, that that never happens and then it happens. That's the, it was the largest fire. It was the most expensive fire. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one wonders how long we can kind of continue that pattern of extreme. Um, I want to come back to some sure. of those threads. So Maricela, what about you? What concerns you most? Hmm. So for me, when I think about climate change, I think about the fact that Mother Earth has been here for four and a half billion years and that during that time, there have been five mass extinctions. And so my bet is that Mother Earth is, is gonna outlive us um, and that climate change is really about humanity. So for as much as climate change and the focus on the environment um, seems, seems to point us outward. Um, it's really about the question of humanity 
and whether humanity will survive or not. And that immediately takes me to the question of, uh, of all the people, who is more likely to survive and who is more likely to perish? And so my greatest concern is that we know from the science, in terms of the impacts of climate change, that low-income communities from throughout the world to here at home um, are the most likely to be vulnerable, the most likely to perish, the most likely to, to have their quality of life um, severely impaired. And if we dig a little deeper, uh, low-income communities are, are pre predominantly, um, disproportionately include women, single moms, people of color throughout the world, and here at home. And so my greatest concern when we talk about climate change is humanity as a whole. And then immediately the question of who will be protected and who will be allowed to be on the, on the front lines of having the greatest vulnerability. And we know from the facts that it's not likely, but it's absolutely low-income people, people of color, low-income women that are on the front lines, and that's my greatest concern. Mm -hmm. Docs, any thoughts from you? What I worry about for our local community is that, um, is whether we will fundamentally learn um, to do things differently for the long haul. Um, I, I can tell you, um, we will rebuild. And in general, we will rebuild in ways that are smarter. More people will rebuild farther away from the creeks to higher ground. Um, and using design that is more suited for our environment. But if the likelihood of this being a climate enhanced event is high, and that the next disaster will also be a climate enhanced event, then if we do not address the reason for the severity of flood and fire, then then we really will fail our community. And I believe that we should, this should create the same kind of energy that the oil spill created. Um, the spill created uh, and helped invigorate uh, really a birthing environmental movement in this nation. Um, and I hope the lessons that we learn um, help shape that movement and expand that movement. Because I, I share Maricela's worry that this isn't just a, a problem that affects endangered species. It's not just a problem that in, affects systems. It fundamentally, climate change to me, is fundamentally about how do we stave off the worst humanitarian disaster that history will have ever known. <clears throat> Moving people causes death, poverty, and misery. And moving large populations always creates that. Um, after World War II, millions of people died after the war just from moving populations. And I feared that for the most poor parts of the world first and think about how our nation will react if we, if our nation is paralyzed politically by 50,000 Syrian refugees, half of them children, possibly being settled here, how will it react to tens of millions of people from Bangladesh, Indonesia, India, and Florida searching for places to live? And I knew this, but I didn't know that it would affect us in the same way. And I think that's what's fundamentally the hardest mm. for this community, is this dark realization that um, sort of the, the darkness, the evil that affects all humanity still can touch us. And overcoming that intimidating realization is our greatest challenge. 
Thank you. I want to take us in a minute here to talking about solutions, but first, just to com finish laying the groundwork here. You know, we've heard about some of the threats um, we, during the presentation from the Bren School, uh, from the UCSB, as well as from James Lee Witt. Um, the, the state of California has actually done a fair amount of work in the area of uh, climate risks to our state, and there are six, and we've heard some of them, um, but increased hot days, and then decreased cool nights, which actually is a kind of a separate thing that they track and does, it does matter because it um, means we have difficulty cooling down. Um, uh, increased fire risk, which we are, we've been talking about. The changes in precipitation, so these, um, we may still get the same amount of precipitation, but we'll get it in different forms. So longer um, cycles of drought with these kind of more extreme rain events, rain bombs, um, atmospheric rivers. And then the last thing which we haven't talked much about tonight is um, sea level rise, which is a more slow moving, but when punctuated with a, um, with a rain event or a storm surge can actually um, cause a lot of damage. Um, what concerns me in all of that is Santa Barbara, just the way in which we're configured, with the mountains and the, and the ocean fairly um, close together, all of our, most of our critical infrastructure is right there in those zones. So we're talking Highway 101, electrical lines, Amtrak lines, I mean, we've experienced all of this. Um, the airport, um, um, anyway, most of our critical infrastructure somehow under threat, if you look at a map over the next couple of decades from some form of climate change. So at some point I wanna get in a little bit to um, what that means to our community. But let's, um, let's talk particularly about this disaster and how, what we've learned and what we might use coming out of this disaster, um, to, whether there are specific opportunities or um, to kind of build resilience while achieving other things that we want to achieve. So I know we've talked about some, there were a couple things that emerged here this evening, um, but is there anything that comes up for, for anyone here just in terms of an opportunity? Well, I think the opportunity is, is uh, <clears throat> people are already taking advantage of the opportunity. It's important to remember people are uh, coming up to myself and other fire uh, chiefs or fire leaders in the county going, well, what are we going to, what, what do you think we should be doing now? And, mm -hmm. and it's important to recognize we're a response agency. You know, what needs to, what, what, where this is going to be solved is at the policy level and the local government level. And, and we're, we're looking at how we responded, um, which we do after every big incident, and, and sometimes it doesn't look very good. It, the, the on, uh, when you have a real honest assessment, it's, it's rough to hear. And, uh, but we're learning from our experiences the, th the things that happened during that, uh, the, especially the debris flow, and, and what, what can we do better. But I think that the, I think Santa Barbara County um, um, is, is taking this very seriously. County government's taking it very seriously. They're um, uh, looking at the looking at the new technological things that we could do. Um, I think that they're looking at public-private partnerships on solving some problems. But we've we just it's just an opportunity to learn about now that we've experienced this. What would we do next time? How could we be more prepared? How 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 would we respond? How do we pr protect infrastructure? Um, all of those things are are critical, and and we have. We have resources in this community, and we have resources we can re reach out to around the globe, and that's what we should be doing now. We're going to be in a, um, uh, Dr. Keller, you know, says you know, it's not likely it'll, it'll not, it'll come next year, but that's not a luxury mm. as first responder that we can, we can, we can live with. We have to assume that until we get some vegetation back up there, we're at risk every time. But I think there's been some really solid work. I'd really like to mention uh, Matt Pontus, who's been working out of the county government. He's, he's been doing a great job. And there are, are people looking at solutions, looking at, um, well, one of the things I'm really interested in is what type of early warning um, systems can we look at that we haven't looked at yet? Um, how can we make our uh, evacuations more, more fixed to, to the, uh, to the area where we think something is going to happen. But like I said, these are they're not 
they're not, there isn't an easy answer to this. They're complex issues so with lots of layers. So certainly um, learning in terms of disaster response, and you've mentioned a couple of times the kind of complexity of that, but um, so some of the takeaways there are um, in, in the early warning system. But expanding out, let's expand out a little bit from that. Doss, any thoughts from you just in terms of um, ways in which we can, during the rebuild process, um, th things that, that we might lift up and, um, and use moving forward? Well, I would just say that we have to think of uh, both the, the immediate and fast disaster, the fire or the flood, um, and mitigating the dangers of that but we also have to look about the slow-moving disaster, which is um, what the economic effects can be over time of losing infrastructure and losing access to infrastructure, or what the fiscal disaster that can result from that can, can create. And in that, I think one of the things that we haven't talked much about is that though we are not an island, we can quickly become one. Um, and we do quickly become one uh, at certain times, and this was one of them. And we are, um, have over the last two generations become a community that um, we, we, we exile our young because of housing prices. And that means we exile most of our first responders because of housing considerations. And if we are going to sometimes, because of disaster, become an island. Um, and we don't address what housing can do to our ability to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And what um, the fiscal woes of our governments um, can do to that ability to respond, then, um, then we will not be, pre be preparing. So that's a, you bring up a really great point. Um, just in terms of the, the, the jobs housing imbalance, how we manage that, um, where we put housing. Let's talk about housing in particular. You've got a, pub, Pat mentioned public-private partnerships. I know the county's got um, a conversation going on right now with AIA, the American Institute of Architects. Do you want to speak to that? Just in terms of what you're hoping to get out of that? Well, uh, it, it is fortunately a great relationship and one in which you harness the creative energy of, uh, I mean, if you ever want to feel better about the world, have a conversation with an architect. Um, <laughs> because they is a profession with a tremendous amount of, of vision, um, uh, a can-do spirit, and, uh, and also they interact as privately with clients. And you know, I guess my view is if people hear the same thing from government and from their architect, then they're going to be more likely mm -hmm. to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And if our unified message is um, we want to help you rebuild while leaving the mud as much as possible in place, that we want to help you rebuild farther away from the creek, that if, if um, you can't rebuild, um, maybe we want to connect you with philanthropy so that that um, parcel becomes part of uh, a public memorial park uh, that can help us increase our resilience as a community. Um, those are the, um, I think, the things that can be helped facilitated by that relationship mm -hmm. between the county and, and the AIA. Yeah, definitely, and some great, great ideas coming out of the community itself, and I think that's also a really, um, uh, uh, great lesson learned and component out of this is the community's involvement. And um, another thing that we had been talking about, about was this advanced home rebuild. So already the state is moving us towards zero net energy homes by 2030 and that the idea of kind of maybe expediting that, um, expediting that process for those who are building back. Maricela, any thoughts from you, just in terms of kind of coming out of this disaster, what we might do to, both in the recovery from this disaster, learning from, learning um, to, and take away lessons from that, but also things that might um, support other goals that we, that we have that 
Yeah, uh, so in terms of the, the disaster, I think that we're um, uh, new to, to this realm of, um, of disaster recovery and disaster intervention. And uh, the reason we, we entered it was because um, of that justice angle. Mm -hmm. And so something to learn is that, you know, again, not, not all people are protected equally. So what we learned from the example of the, the Thomas fire um, going into, from Ventura County into Santa Barbara County is that farm workers were, were not thought of. And so farm workers were out there working um, when the air quality was incredibly poor, when everybody was staying home. Um, we found out that Cal OSHA um, sent their people home from Oxnard. So Cal OSHA's job is to take care of workers. And so those state employees were at home while farm workers were literally out in the field um, with no one advocating for them that they shouldn't be um, working out in the field. So it really brought home to us um, how even during a disaster, um, we don't think of workers. Um, we've heard from partner organizations from LA with the Bell Air Fire where um, landscapers were, were asked to stay at work, outdoor landscapers, while the office folks were told to go home. Um, so I think that crisis brings out the best and also unfortunately also reveals our warts. And I think what we saw is that, um, is, is some of those warts that um, not all workers are, are treated equally. And so as we move forward to, um, to think about workers who are um, on, on the front lines. Um, and then the, the other is in terms of language access, mm -hmm. right? That very little information um, was available during the crisis. And then looking back in terms of disaster preparedness, mm -hmm. right? In terms of the information that gets to all communities, low-income communities again, communities of color, Spanish-speaking communities, Mixteco-speaking communities that we have here in, in our region. Um, and then the, the other is um, that I think we do need to look at, once a disaster happens, um, who, who, was, who was impacted to see what we can learn. So I say this because in the Montecito mudslides, um, it, out of the 23 deaths, um, and every single one of those deaths, um, an incredible loss. Any loss of life is um, an incredible tragedy. Um, but then we, we also need to look whether there were certain populations were, that were disproportionately um, impacted. So Montecito is a community that's 97% white, and a third of the deaths were immigrants. Um, Along, uh, along the other um, demographics, so the deaths range from age two to um, 80, so across the lifespan. Um, coincidentally, uh, it was pretty much 50% female, 50% male, coincidentally. Um, but when, it, when you look at class and uh, immigration uh, status, how is it that a community that's 97% white, um, native-born, and a third of the deaths are immigrant. Um, th so, specifically, it was landscapers. It was one landscaper from Mexico and, and the wives of two other landscapers that lived on the properties and their children. So, um, I think that that, that bears um, some study uh, as to um, why that disproportionate impact and again, to be very sensitive to any life being lost. But because life is so precious, if once we look at the details, we find that there are subpopulations that are disproportionately harmed, then we believe that that uh, merits looking uh, deeper in order to prevent yeah. such uh, losses in the future. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> So I heard some really great um, things here just in terms of, you know, just lessons learned and coming out of, of this experience moving forward, um, some things we'd like to work on. Um, communication to all community members, absolutely. An early warning system, refining the early warning system. We've talked a little bit about um, how we build back um, and a little bit about where we build back. So I'm going to 
actually, that was one thing I wanted to bring up. Um, I think you mentioned this, Pat, that the, the, the back burns in Ventura County were done pri primarily on private ag lands. Were you talking about that? I, I Maybe it was somebody who sent me a note about that. Um, the, those private ag lands helped protect the spaces, uh, in, particularly in the Carpinteria area, and that that was one of the um, suggestions moving forward was land conservation easements and ag buffer zones. That is, is that something that you've been thinking about or talking about, Doss? Yeah, I, I don't think necessarily to create, if the goal is to create a, a buffer around creeks um, that so that uh, the county flood control and others could effectively manage that, um, uh, maybe restore natural creek banks, have better flood control mm -hmm. capacity. One thing that would help that is if there was private, if there was acquisition of that land by a nonprofit. The other thing that would do it is just simply if homeowners were willing to grant easements along that uh, a zone where they wouldn't want to build or would provide the ability for the county to be able to get in there to do preventative work at, at uh, a continuous basis or at a regular basis. And so I think maybe a patchwork of public acquisition and, 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 and private easements um, could could really increase our resilience in the long run. Um, not only would it provide a place um, to stage equipment, but it also might provide a place to remember um, what we have been through as a community. Um, and that's why I think it's a practical um, value uh, in terms of flood control, control capacity and, and keeping homes out of harm's way, but it's also uh, a, a values, a reminder um, of what we've been through and um, that we should learn from it. Mm -hmm. So let's lift our gaze a little bit. Um, I know it's been um, really difficult last few months and we've been rightfully so focused on, on the last um, couple of disasters, although you definitely gave us a perspective that some of what you've been seeing has been taking place over the last um, few years, Pat. Um, so as we kind of look forward, and one of the um, stats that really got my attention at the beginning of the year is that there's been a 330% increase in um, weather-related disaster worldwide since 1980. 330%, so it's a very steep chart. And there's nothing that I've really heard tonight or in any of my studies that suggests to me that that number is going down. So in addition, um, so we're, we're likely to be experiencing um, disaster in some form worldwide, and, and as we've seen in the, um, in the U.S., last year was the most expensive disaster year on record um, for, for the nation. Um, so as we look kind of forward and think about how we prepare and we think about our, how we invest in that, um, are there particular political or social or infrastructure um, changes that you would recommend? And, and I really encourage us to kind of think big and put out some big ideas here in terms of what we need to be doing over the next few decades. Um, and they may be things we need to do anyway. As I said, they may have, there may be co-benefits. Um, so any thoughts along, along those lines? Well, I, I think that um, this area is taking a, um, we've got a good start on looking at, like the county's looking at a strategic recovery plan. There's the, like I said, we're, we're responders, we're not policy, mm -hmm. policy people, but I think it's really important that everybody doesn't plant their flag and say, I won't back down on anything here. That, that, that uh, whether it's an environmental uh, position or development position mm -hmm. or um, whatever your, your interest is, if it becomes a zero sum game and everybody loses, and let, you know, unless, I, unless I win, I'm gonna make everybody else lose a little bit, um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be able to do anything that's gonna be meaningful, that's gonna be produce true resiliency. We've gotta be willing to look at the other person's point of view. We've gotta be willing to have a cooperative discussion and um, getting into the zero sum uh, fight for, uh, for something you may passionately believe in um, doesn't bode well for us moving forward. I know that we had some conversation around that, particularly around debris, the debris basins, and um, 
Maybe we'll come back to that in a moment, but any thoughts from you? Yeah, I have three. Um, one is, is that um, if there's any fight worth fighting, it's, it's the fight for Mother Earth, and it's the fight for our very lives. And so, so we, can't be, we can't be afraid to fight. That solutions do include fighting and staving off worse threats that would make things worse. So tomorrow we're, we're celebrating along with many of our partners, the Environmental Defense Center and um, uh, Earth Justice and Sierra Club, uh, City of Oxnard, um, because we won against the, the Puente power plant. That was huge. I mean, that was a four, and it was a three to four year battle. And when we started it, um, we knew it was an uphill battle, um, and we weren't particularly confident that, that it was winnable. Um, but we were willing to fight for it, and, um, and, it, and, and we had a victorious um, outcome. And not only did we collectively, because it was a collective um, uh, fight, um, from the grassroots to the legal to um, the politicians, but, um, uh, but not only did we r run NRG out of Oxford in a new power plant, but you know they they said they're leaving Elwood, right? They're they're leaving Galita, they're leaving this area. So it, it's going to require it's going to require a, a, a fight. But again, if anything's worth fighting for, it's it's our earth and, and humanity. Second, um, you know, from a sort of big level, um, you know, campaign like that to what might seem like the mundane, what Supervisor Williams mentioned, housing. You know, no one, typically no one thinks of housing when they think about climate change or disaster. But housing is absolutely critical to us both staving off climate change and resilience during disaster. Um, we have so many commuters that go from Santa Barbara, um, that work in Santa Barbara, but live elsewhere because they can't afford to be here. So in terms of becoming an island during a disaster, those two weeks that the 101 was closed, because people who work here weren't living here, right, th the city was impacted. Um, and, and in terms of the imp impact on climate change with the commuters, right, with that long commute. So the city of Santa Barbara has the opportunity to um, implement a 15% inclusionary housing Ordinance and what that means is is that that it would uh, incentivize and uh, and support 15% moderate um, to low income housing within um, market rate homes. That absolutely has to do with our resiliency, um, with staving off um, worse results from climate change, and to protect to protecting ourselves during a disaster. And then lastly, our power at the ballot box and the resiliency that, that comes from um, creating legislate, legislation that uh, impacts us all. So this November, it's already qualified for the ballot, Prop 70, we're urging a no on Prop 70. What they're attempting to do is require a two-thirds vote in both um, the Senate and the Assembly at the state level um, for any decisions on the use of cap-and-trade funds. Uh, and We've known from, um, you know, prior to 2010, when the state legislature had to have a two-thirds majority to pass the budget, where we were always late on that budget, and voters tore that um, down in 2010, and now we have budgets that pass on time. Well, if we're going to require two-thirds to determine when we allocate cap-and-trade funds to come to our communities, we're never going to get to a solution. So vote no on Prop 70 come November. You can almost think that Marcella and I planned the <laughs> talking points because in the past, our community and our movement um, has been defined by what we could say no to, um, what we could defeat. And um, this is a cap, good capstone victory, but it should be one that ushers in a different age in which we are defined by what we say yes to. And this is gonna be very difficult, uh, as my buddy Abe Powell uh, 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 um, pointed out to me, he said, what do Montecitans hate more than anything else? Uh, and I would actually say all Santa Barbara's. He said, change. Um, but we have to 
we cannot create resilience in our community. I mean, every time we have one of these disasters, our power goes out. We fire up tons of dirty diesel generators to make up for it, and we end up having dirtier energy than before. We cannot stand up for the values that we believe in, nor can we have a resilient community unless we build local renewable energy. And, and it's, it's really important to know that for all our symbolic acts and all our commitments, we have failed to do that. There is no utility scale renewable energy facility in the entire south coast of Santa Barbara. And we think of ourselves as the visionaries that started this. Mm -hmm. And um, we can turn that around. I think it's also about what do we say yes to in terms of technologies, um, thinking about flood control in a more creative way. Um, are we going to revert, as uh, Professor Anderson predicted, within three years, are we going to revert back to being NIMBYs? Or are we going to have the vision for resilience and for responsibility in the long run? Thank you. You know, I was with a, um, a group of about 60 or 70 planners and emergency respond, responders at an event yesterday um, that was serving the six counties from Santa Cruz down to Ventura, and it was um, based, excuse me, it was focused on climate resilience. And the question was asked of this group, what would you do, again, taking a longer look um, in terms of potential collaboration um, regionally, what would you all do if um, kind of politics aside, which is a really interesting question. And the, that group came up with two um, kind of very bold ideas that, um, that I wanted to share with you. And one was this idea of kind of downzoning or not rebuilding in high risk areas. I know it's a very politically sensitive um, topic, but I wanted to share that if you take smart people who, um, who do this for a living and are extremely familiar with the issues, what kind of answer they would give. And the other ha was a longer view, um, particularly looking at sea level rise, was um, this idea of creating a regional 50-year retreat plan for sea level rise. So again, this is um, uh, maybe not necessarily politically feasible, but definitely the types of things that I got my thinking going um, in terms of when you take people who, um, who are tasked with taking a long look at climate change and what we can do about it, where, where they landed. I did want to share with you some things that were emerging from um, our questions of the audience and over Earth Day and over Twitter. Uh, a couple things that emerged included uh, large-scale rainwater harvesting as a potential um, strategy that we can be part, um, taking a look at now as we come out of this current disaster recovery. Um, I know that you've been involved a little bit in the conversation around a Montecito microgrid, so that was um, something that somebody flagged. And then we've talked about one of the other concepts here with about rethinking density and replacing single homes with multi-unit housing. So those were some of the things that were on the card that I wanted to share with you. Um, before I close, um, and give you each just a, a, a minute to share some last thoughts. I did want to particularly call out the County of Santa Barbara's new, um, you have a new office. Um, did you want to make, maybe close with that and mention the office and, and what that's been doing? I know there have been a lot of really successful partnerships, public-private pri partnerships, and I know that the county is really looking to hear from, from the community, not just serve the community, but hear from the community. Wanna sure. Um, well, number one, uh, we've opened the Montecito Recovery Center, um, which is down on Coast Village Circle, just off Coast Village Road, um, at uh, what was the Orfila Center down there. Uh, it's a great place that if you, um, and please spread the word if you know someone who lost their home or uh, is in need of other services, um, it's a great place to be able to interact with a planner if you are tr trying to figure out how to rebuild. It's a great place to get help to um, clean objects that were lost in, in the mud. Uh, a great place um, to get um, even a little bit of uh, uh, a pick-me-up 
from uh, uh, you know some counseling services. Mm -hmm. um, we offer many different services down there, and and those services that the county doesn't offer, many nonprofits offer down there, and we try to house as many community resources as possible. Um, the other, uh, you know, is um, I think it's it's important to to know that we still are facing some big decisions about how to rebuild um, and what, what values we place highest. And I think um, it's important to think about the built environment, and that's what we as Santa Barbarans are very good at, but it's really even more important in my view to think about who is in the built environment as we go forward. Um, if we uh, fundamentally make the wrong decision um, and um, we change the economics of the community that we live in, if we um, make some of the wrong decisions on infrastructure, then we destroy our economy. If we make those, some of the wrong decisions on housing, then we destroy middle class or first force a working class out of the community. And that is perpetually our struggle, but it will be the struggle of, of what priorities as we rebuild in Montecito as well. Okay, thank you. Pat, any last thoughts from you? And before you go there, I also I wanted to recognize one conversation that you and I had about you, how you mentioned that um, you said fire is, is regionalized now, and that partnership really required a kind of a regional effort. I, I think what, what in, in our operational area, Santa Barbara County, we've, um, the fire chiefs have kind of come to an agreement that there were, we're, with the technology we have now um, of dropping borders. Mm -hmm. So um, if it doesn't matter what color the fire truck is when you're having a heart attack, and we can, and when a dispatch, we get a common dispatch center, and we can um, ability to see who's closest um, and forget about the territorial stuff. And it's, it's a big, it's, it may seem like it's a, it's a ridiculous notion that we would be doing that, but the technology to figure out who's closest and what's the best response didn't exist till recently, mm -hmm. and, and now we're looking at that. One of the things that I, that I think about just in terms of handling a big, big problem and a complex problem, um, in 1972, um, about 12,000 people a year died in fires in the United States, which was a, it was a staggering, uh, staggering figure, and um, so, a bipartisan uh, commission was put together and the project was called America's, America's Burning. And it was um, uh, actually came, came under uh, President Nixon. Um, and they, and they, they decided to find out why this was happening. And, uh, and it turned into to a lot of things they weren't expecting. How children's clothes are made, how homes are heated, what's a smoke detector, um, just the fabrics. It's, and, and they looked at it at a, at a, at a, at a in a massive way, complex way. And um, I just hope there's the will to still do something like that in a country that's as fractured as ours. Mm -hmm. But the, the deaths uh, last year in the United States were uh, under 3,400. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, they cut the, the, um, the death rate from, you know, by 75%. And, but it took a really complex, bipartisan group of people looking at something. And that's kind of, uh, we're, we're at a point now where our challenge is gonna be, do we still have that capability as a, as a country mm -hmm. to look at something mm -hmm. that is affecting all of us and, and solve a problem of that magnitude? And uh, this, this magnitude that we're looking at now is, is far greater than just the you know, house fires and the, and, the, and the deaths that are associated with them, but it's the survival of the, you know, our, our country, our planet mm -hmm. you know, as well. And do we, do we have the capability and the will um, to still do a pot, something that big. Yeah. Even, if, even if we don't in the country, we do here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that is the light in this darkness. Mm -hmm. That, that even, even as people realized that we, we are so affected by that same darkness, people pulled closer together. The, 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 the fences are literally down in Montecito. And the fences between us have to keep on coming down. We need to pull together as a community and we can lead that way um, no matter what happens yeah. in the 
in Great. the rest yeah. of the country. Maricela, bring it home. Yeah, so along those lines of uh, breaking down, down fences and, and coming together and, and the light and the darkness, so uh, a pitch for um, a contribution to the 805 and DocuFund. Uh, we have about 1,400 people who are on the waiting list. These are low-wage, um, undocumented, mixed-status families who were impacted by the disaster. So, again, in terms of you know Montecito, Carpinteria area, you know they lost time off work as, as farm workers. Um, they don't have uh, you know they're in house cleaning and there are not homes to clean in Montecito or the businesses are closed and so they can't. Um, uh, they're still looking for a job. So um, we're still trying to raise another million dollars um, to disperse for economic relief to those families. Um, and then secondly, um, organize, organize, organize. So you know the difference between activism and organizing is that um, in activism, um, you know you propel your, your, yourself. Um, in organizing, you always bring a new person or several new people who you know haven't been involved or aren't currently involved and you help create that that tide that ocean right create from from one drop to many drops to um, a, a tide that says yes to what we need and that provides the backing and the inspiration and the motivation for the public decision makers to do things that you know otherwise they would be afraid um, to do or um, you know just you know aren't sure whether they should do um, so organize 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 for inclusionary housing for more bike lanes for better public transportation for renewable energy there's a plethora of things to organize and in organizing we find our community and we find our human dignity and we affirm that life is worth living and that life is worth fighting for and that the vision that we have we can make it real <laughs> Well, thank you. And, you know, I said at the beginning that we were just going to barely scratch the surface. There's so much to talk about here. Uh, you know, as I said, the Community Environmental Council has been working for over a decade on climate mitigation um, strategies, including, including trying to get those renewable energy projects that Doss is um, referring to. Um, it is time now, I think, that we talk about what climate adaptation looks like. And really, for me, the, the hope in all of this is the way in which um, community can be stitched together. I think tonight is a perfect example of that. We've just, we've had a, a great room, a great conversation. Um, as I said, I'm hoping that this continues into some sort of symposium later in the year. And I want to please join me in thanking our panelists. So thank you, Sigrid, Doss. Pat and Maricela. Steve, thanks for sharing some of your rock stars with us tonight. And we hope to hear a lot more from them in the future. James, thank you. And we are so fortunate as a community that James Lee Witt and his organization are going to be working more with our county. So that's just great for us. I want to just amplify uh, what Sigrid said. When we sat down, the four organizations, and began to plan for tonight, we immediately said, this is not a one-off. We are developing a strategic partnership between CEC, the museum, the foundation, and the Bren School, and we want to keep this conversation going in a variety of ways going forward. So more to come, folks. I want to thank Joe Black. And finally, a shout out to a very good friend and colleague to many of us at the Santa Barbara Foundation, Sharon Main, who celebrates her birthday today with all of us. Thank you, Sharon. So thank you, everybody. Good night and be safe.